Well, we arrive today in our study through the Gospels, and and we have an opportunity now to listen to the most famous sermon of all time. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. Luke chapter 6 tells us here in verse 17, Jesus stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people. Now, the location here is uncertain, but it's been long identified with a hillside on the north end of the Sea of Galilee. I've had the privilege of standing there myself on that hillside that provided this beautiful grass-covered natural amphitheater. Thousands of people could sit on that hillside and easily hear the Lord preaching down below. Now, the most detailed account of Jesus' sermon is recorded in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And the Lord begins by delivering what we call the Beatitudes. So we'll start there. Now, the word Beatitude is Latin. It means bliss or blessedness. You could even translate it genuine happiness. And Jesus is going to grab the attention of the crowd by telling them, basically, how they can find that rather elusive element of life that mankind has been chasing throughout history true happiness. But it must stun this multitude when Jesus' first point, given here in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3, is this. Happy, or blessed, are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now, these people have been hearing from their rabbis for generations. It's put this way. Blessed are the perfect in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. Blessed are those who recognize that they are not perfect in spirit. Now, just what does poor in spirit mean? Well, the word translated poor describes people who are so deeply poverty stricken that they have to depend entirely upon someone else to survive. Poverty of spirit, then, is an awareness that we are completely and utterly dependent upon Christ. You could actually paraphrase Jesus here to be saying, happy are the helpless, because they're the ones who trust their eternal future to Christ alone. Well, now here's Jesus' second path to true happiness in verse 4. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, there seems to be a progression in these Beatitudes, I want to point out. Once we discover the bankruptcy of our heart in verse 3, we're led to mourn over sin in verse 4, which ultimately brings forgiveness and comfort from the Lord. That's the path to happiness. He's talking about uh, here uh, weeping over sin. In fact, he uses the strongest Greek word for mourning. He's describing the mourning of grief, the level of grief you feel as you mourn the loss of a loved one. Jesus is telling us that mourners discover true happiness because uh, they're the ones grieving over their sins and, and their sinfulness. And in so doing, where do they go? Well, they come to the Savior for forgiveness and, and find it uh, through Christ as they trust him by faith. So you could paraphrase Jesus to be saying here, blessed are the brokenhearted. Blessing comes to those who confess their sin to Christ. Now, let me point out that this verb to mourn is talking about continuous action. In other words, just because you've been redeemed doesn't mean you never get past the need for God's forgiveness. In fact, the older you get, the more you realize how much you sin I think the mature Christian is not necessarily someone who sins less, although we want that, we strive for that. But a mature Christian is someone who confesses more quickly. So how quick are you today to mourn over and confess that sinful thought or deed? 
Well, this attitude of quickly confessing sin happens to be the pathway that continually leads you along a path of genuine happiness. Jesus is saying in this passage, do you know who the truly happy people are? (laughs) They're the ones who admit they're sinful. They're the ones who bring their sins to me. They are the moment-by-moment confessors. Blessed are the brokenhearted, for they shall be comforted, not only now, but forever in heaven one day. Well, now Jesus goes on to surprise his audience again with another stepping stone to happiness. He says here in verse 5, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And I'm thinking, really? The meek, you know, they don't inherit the earth. They get run over on earth. (laughs) Sounds a little bit to me like that little boy is being pushed around by the school bully. Every day this bully demanded that that little boy hand over his lunch money. It was a dollar a day, five dollars a week. That little boy wasn't strong enough to do anything about it. But then he saw an advertisement for karate lessons. and He knew, well, that's what he needed to learn to stand up to this bully. He was so excited about it until he found out the lessons were going to cost five dollars a week. So... He just went back to paying the bully. It was a lot less trouble. Well, when we think of meekness, we, we naturally think of weakness, don't we? The meek lose their lunch money. The meek don't inherit the earth. They get ground down into the earth. Well, let me tell you, even though English dictionaries define meekness as a form of cowardice, in the Bible, Meekness is not weakness. Meekness is power under control. In fact, the word for meek used here is used of a horse being ridden with a bridle. So meekness is strength under control. It's being strong enough, by the way, to strike back at that bully, but choosing not to get even. So Jesus is saying here that the meek are those who have their strength under control. And guess what happens? Well, they're going to inherit the earth. The word inherit, by the way, is a future tense verb. It's going to happen in the future. In other words, you're, you're not in charge now, and you won't be. But one day, you, the redeemed, will be. You're going to literally rule planet Earth. You're going to co-reign with Jesus Christ in that coming kingdom, according to Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Well, now, here in verse 6 of Matthew chapter 5, Jesus delivers yet another shocking statement. He says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Now, we've got to clear something up first. Is the Lord referring to objective righteousness, that that righteousness was credited to your account when you were saved? Well, that can't be because... We then already possess this righteousness of Christ as a gift from God through faith in his Son, Romans 3, 21 and 22. We've already been declared righteous. We've already been declared right with God. That's what righteous means, right with God. So the Lord isn't talking about becoming right with God. He's talking about living right for God, hungering and thirsting after God. Righteousness means you have a passionate longing to be right with God, to be pleasing to God by the way that you live for him. Let me tell you, the happiest person on the planet is not the richest person. It isn't the healthiest person. It's the person who hungers to know the Lord and to please him. So the question here is this, what are you hungry for today? I have read that Socrates was once approached by a young student of his who asked him, how can I have the wisdom that you have? Socrates said, follow me. And he led him down to the sea and then waded right in. Well, the young man hesitated and then, well, followed after him. They got about waist deep, and Socrates suddenly turned around, grabbed this young man by the nap of the neck, pushed his head underwater, and held him under as that young man thrashed about, desperate to breathe. 
At the last moment, Socrates pulled him up, dragged him to the shore, then asked him, when I held your head under water, what did you want more than anything? And the young man sputtered, air, sir, air. Socrates told him, when you want wisdom as badly as you wanted air, you will find it. So how hungry are you today to live a life that pleases the Lord? You know, ask the average Christian out there, do you want to please God with your life? And the answer is probably going to be, well, well, sure. I, I, but I also want God to do some things that please me by giving me this or that. Many, many Christians just aren't quite hungry enough for holy living. And this lack of hunger becomes their greatest obstacle to finding true, genuine happiness. So let's pray like this today. Lord, give me a hunger to hunger after you. Give me a thirst that's thirsty for you, being right with God, righteous, right with God. Make me hungry and thirsty for a life that's pleasing to you. Well, let me tell you, according to the greatest sermon and the greatest preacher ever, that's the path to true happiness. Jesus promised it here. Happy, blessed are those who are hungry and thirsty to be right with God, for they shall be satisfied. But with that, we're out of time for today. Until we set sail again on our wisdom journey, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.